Genesis chapter 38 and beginning at verse 11 as we continue our series dealing with damaged. Sometimes you go through a series of events in your life and you have survived the events, but then you turn around and you look at yourself and you realize I am damaged. Sometimes you can drive through a storm and as you drive through the storm, uh, you made it through the storm and then you park in your driveway and when you park in your driveway and you get out the car, have anybody ever looked at your hood and you looked at your vehicle and you realize that uh, it's been kissed by many, <laughs> by many dents and you realize, oh my goodness, I have hell damage. Uh, I've... I made it through the storm, but I did not make it through the storm like I was when I entered in. And so sometimes you can go through a series of events and things in your life and you realize I'm, I'm broken. You don't laugh the same. You don't pray the same. You don't see life the same. Stuff that used to be funny, it ain't funny anymore. Even though the sun is shining, it's not as bright as it used to be. Sometimes you can get your heart broken and you can make it the next day. But music don't even sound the same. Amen. And you can, you can sing to God, but your, but your tone is even different. Sometimes you just have to look yourself in the mirror and say, something's wrong with me. Something's wrong. And just because something's wrong doesn't mean that you're outside of the will of God. It just means that you've been through some things. And once you come to the knowledge that you're damaged, then you can't keep doing the same things as if everything is normal. You can't walk around like you're healthy when you know you're sick. If you know you're sick, you gotta change your diet, you gotta change your regimen, you gotta get some rest, you gotta change how you operate. And many times when we're broken and, and we're damaged, you know what we try to do in the face of other people? We try to act like everything is good. I remember I thought uh, I was coming into puberty and I started doing some push-ups and I started uh, doing, you know, I was starting to work out and everything and I felt like I was getting strong and I felt like it was time for me, you know, I was smelling myself uh, and I started flexing. Uh, this was at the same time, and y'all don't understand, I'm, a, I'm an 80s baby, so this was in the same time, like on Saturday, Kung Fu came on. Uh, <laughs> y'all remember when Kung, Kung Fu came on on Saturdays after, after the cartoons. So after the cartoons, Kung Fu would come on and I would come, and so I would do my little push-ups, and then my mama uh, and my daddy, bless their heart, and they got me some karate pants, and so I had some. <laughs> And I had the little belt and everything, but I was trying to, I was trying to little flex. And so I remember after, you know, doing my own little personal practicing, uh, I felt like, I felt like I had arrived. I felt like I had arrived. I felt like I was where I needed to be. I saw enough for a little Bruce Lee and everything. And I had played the video game and everything. So I was, I felt like I was ready. And so I went up to my brother, my older brother, and I said, uh, he, and he was watching television and I, and I, uh, I walked up to him and I said, uh, I said, I'm ready. <laughs> Y'all know what that means. I, I, said, I said, hey, listen, I'm, <laughs> I said, I'm ready. And uh, he said, ready for what? <laughs> I, said, I said, come on down to, we had like a little red room. And the red room w was the place where nobody would go. Uh, it's, it's the place where nobody was supposed to sit. My, you know, everybody had that room growing up. Nobody was supposed to go in there. And so, but there was a little open space in there. And so, you know, our parents was gone. And I said, no, I'm ready. Let's get this, let's get this going on. Cause I had been practicing. And so, uh, I should have known something by the way he shrugged. He was like. <laughs> and, so, and so he got up and he went to the red room and so, uh, what I had did 
is I had because uh, just like the just like the movie, I had I had took my <laughs> I had took my little top off and I had threw that off to the side. I also I also should have known that there was another red flag because the way he was laughing at my chest. <laughs> There was a, like another sign, this probably not gonna go like I think it's gonna go. And so uh, I, I remember I had I did all of these things. And so um, uh, I, I, I did the little stance and, I'm, and, and he's just standing there and he's not getting in position. He's just standing there. And I'm like, you need to get ready cause I'm about to bring it. And he just kind of looked at And so uh, at the appropriate time, what I thought was a good time and I thought I would charge. And so I, I charged them. And so, um, so I remember charging them. And <laughs> I remember charging them. And, and so um, I didn't see him hit me. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see it. <laughs> I didn't see it. Um, but I remember, I remember like I couldn't breathe. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. Like, I didn't know where the air went. <laughs> like, and this had never happened to me before. And he knew exactly where to hit me. And I, I'm like, I'm, I'm gasping for air. And so the next thing that I remember, like I'm on the floor and my, my brother became a missionary. He be, my brother became a nurse. And so he knelt down beside me and, and he said, breathe. <laughs> He said, Bree, it's okay. He said, no, 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 no. He said, no, 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 don't scream, sister. He said, it's okay. And so sometimes, um, and so I'm, I'm angry. Don't miss, don't miss the point. I'm angry because the person who hurt me is trying to make me feel better. Have you ever been there before? Amen. Where the person who hurt you it's also the same person who's trying to hug you and say it's okay. The person who cussed you out and embarrassed you, the person who betrayed you, the person who stabbed you in the back says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then they say, come on, give me a hug. And the person that you're hugging and you've read the scripture and the Bible told you you're supposed to forgive. So you read the scripture and then you're hugging them and you're saying, I forgive you but you're hurting and the person who hurts you is the person who's in your face trying to, sending you scriptures about forgiveness. <laughs> have, you ever got a, have you ever got a text or, or an encouragement from the person who hurt? And so now I'm damaged, <laughs> I'm damaged and and then here's, here's the other problem. I'm gasping for air, but we're not supposed to be fighting. That's one of the rules in the house. You're not supposed to be fighting. And then here's another offense. We're not supposed to be in this room. <laughs> Y'all see the plastic. We're not, <laughs> we not supposed to be in here. We're not supposed to even be uh, playing in here. We didn't been told over. And so uh, when, 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 when my mother comes, now, if you have been there before, now I got to act like, because if I act like I hurt, I'm hurt, she going to ask what happened. And then she going to ask, well, where did this take place? <laughs> now, now, my brother don't want to get in trouble. And, and, and so my brother doesn't want to get in trouble. And so what he does is, <laughs> when he see this, uh, <laughs> my brother don't want to get in trouble. So he's standing beside me while we talking to my parents. <laughs> and he's rubbing my back. <laughs> he says, shh, shh, shh. no, no. <laughs> and so, and so now I gotta stand there, but I'm hurt. <laughs> and, I, I, and I don't know what's going on with my chest because it's throbbing. <laughs> Just don't know what's going on. And so I'm hurt, <laughs> I'm hurt and trying to act like everything and then we're fine. And, 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 and then what he starts to do is, he starts to promise me candy. 
He starts to promise me candy. I'm using this on a small level, but I need you to apply this on other levels. So now I got to put a face on like nothing's wrong when really I can't breathe. And I really need my mama to hold me because right because I don't know. <laughs> I'm hurting. But I got to put this face on because I don't want anybody to think I'm not the man. Do you know how many men are walking around broken, but they got their shoulders back and they got their head up and they put on a good face? Because I don't want you to think I'm hurting. And I don't want you to think that I'm not the man. And it's hard because the longer you put that face on like nothing's wrong, especially for men, can't really speak for women, because I'm a man. Uh -huh. But, but for, for most men, we can get so good at acting like Nothing phases me. Nothing hurts me. No, nothing, I mean, you know what, I'm above it all. Matter of fact, nothing bothers me. You can put on that face for so long that you will become out of tune. You won't be connected to your own pain. So then when somebody asks you what's wrong, you won't even know how to break it down and explain because you have disconnected from even showing that you're hurt. And depending on what community that you're in, if you show that you're hurt, some people attack you more. So sometimes the reason why you put on the face is so that other people won't expose your pain even deeper or make fun of you or laugh at you. Because if you do try to open up and say, you know, my heart is kind of, man up. Shake that off. And once you become insensitive to my vulnerability, it doesn't open back up again. There are some, some of you, you hadn't been open since Biggie died. <laughs> <laughs> it's that 98, <laughs> you ain't... <laughs> Some, <laughs> nice. so, some, of you, some, of, some of you haven't been vulnerable since the last person you trusted was untrustworthy. And you tried to share how hurt or broken you were and you didn't get the response that you were looking for. So you know what you said? Forget it. And then you start, you start entertaining thoughts. Nobody cares about me. Nobody cares about how I feel. So the next time somebody asks me how I feel, I need to, some of you practice on what to say so that people won't keep asking more questions about you. And so you start playing tricks in your mind. So what happens is when somebody asks, hey, what's going on? Hey, uh, you look sad. Hey, you, you don't look well. You practice your speech. Because if you, if you are truthful, then you fear that you'll be exposed. So there are some people say, if I say something nice, or if I say something good, if I say, hey, I'm doing great, do you know most people don't pray for you after you say you're doing great? Did you know that? Did you know if you say, I'm having an awesome day, do you know that most people don't go to God on your behalf when you say you're having an awesome day? So what some people do to hide is that they give false statements of praise and blessings to ward off anybody from investigating how broken they are. Because if you really knew how hurt I was, you would realize and you would find out I do have suicidal thoughts, and I'm a Christian. I want to quit and leave all of this behind, and I'm a Christian. 
there are some people who are having thoughts, I really want to just leave my family and my children and be done with all of this, men and women. And they're a Christian. There are some people, it's dangerous for them to drive. They don't even like driving because they have thoughts of just going off. How many people go to work uh, a day in and day out and want to just clear out the whole room because they're tired and they're hurt and they're broken? And when you're damaged, it's not good. Before we dive into text, there's something that I, I appreciate about the state of Texas. Now, I, ha I hate paying it, but I appreciate it. You can have something wrong with your car all year long, but you get to a point of state in, uh, inspection, right? In state inspection, what they do is that you take your vehicle and you have to go in and you have to get it inspected. And they inspect your vehicle from all of these different points. If you don't pass the inspection, then what they say is, we're going to give you so much time to fix, right? But if you get caught by the police driving without an inspection, they give you a ticket. And the reason why they're fining you is they say, hey, listen, you have something that's not, you have some damage, you have something that's broken in your vehicle, and you become a liability, don't miss it you become a liability to the other drivers. It's, it's not even about you. You may not even care about you, but the reason why we require you to get an inspection is because your vehicle affects everybody else on the road. So if you keep driving like this, there's a great possibility. And one of the th things that they do is they check your tires and they say, hey, listen, there's a great possibility you could be driving. And if you don't get that tire fixed, it can pop while you're driving. You could end up having an accident on other people. You need to get that fixed. And then they'll say, hey, listen, your emissions. And they'll say, hey, listen, your, your blinker, your, your things don't work. Your, your lights, because if you're trying to make a right, yeah, some of y'all don't use your blinkers anyway. But uh, if, if you're trying to uh, go to the next lane, and somebody can't see, you could possibly cause the death. And so what we're trying to do is we want to make sure, this is what State of Texas say, we want to make sure that everything in your vehicle is working properly so that when it's time to stop and go and turn and that you have the appropriate lights and that they're visible, that everybody around can see and that you have full control of your vehicle. Because if not, you can hurt the rest of us. And then also, you can hurt your, can I tell you on this morning? It's not healthy to walk around damaged. It's okay to be damaged because it's life. It happens. But it's not healthy and it's not good to stay broken all year long without you pulling in and having a spiritual inspection and saying, you know what, y'all? I got to tell y'all, it's not good for me to be around y'all too long because there's some things in me that's not working. Hey, my, my patience stick ain't working. <laughs> my patience my patience stick. Hey, my, my love, my love breaks and gas, they don't work because I've been betrayed. And so now I don't, I don't stop like I should and I, and I go when I'm supposed to stop and there's something in me that's not working and I need to, to get this fixed. So in Genesis chapter 38, Tamar is married to a husband, but the Bible says he's so wicked that God takes him. And when God takes him, she becomes a widow. The Bible says she gets married a second time to his brother and the Bible says he did not want to do right by her. He, 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 he didn't want to do right by her. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in chapter 38, let's look at verse 8. Let's go to verse 8. Genesis chapter 38, and we'll look at verse 8. And Judah said to Onan, go into thy brother's wife, marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. So anything that is produced by this child goes to uh, his, his brother that is deceased, it does not go to him. 
And so Onan did not want to do right by her. And the Bible says, and Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. So you can imagine Tamar, she's, she's married to a man that really doesn't want to have a family with her. I need you to understand what that does mentally. I'm married to a man who doesn't have a problem coming in and being with me physically. But the idea of having a family displeases him so that he takes measures to make sure that I don't get pregnant. I'm not some woman he just met. I'm not some side chick in in town somewhere. I'm his wife, and he is intentionally making sure that we don't have a family and he doesn't impregnate me. He doesn't have a problem being with me physically. That doesn't disgust him. What he's trying to prevent, and, and the thing that he's thinking about is resources and money. Because if, I, if he has a child with me, then anything that comes from that child goes uh, for his brother's estate. And it will go to her. So he wants the intimacy. He doesn't want the responsibility of raising or having a family, even though she'll be his wife. God looks at their marriage. And when God looks at their marriage, he says, I don't like this. That's the word displeased in verse 10. God looks at their relationship. Sometimes, can I pause here for a second? Can, I need permission. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's permission. Sometimes God will look at a relationship and it doesn't please him. You want to make sure that the relationship that you're in, that when God looks at it, it pleases him. Because if it does not please him, can I tell you something? Trouble is coming. Trouble is coming. And so it displeased the Lord, and Tamar was doing everything right. Sometimes trouble will come down your street, and you're doing everything right. Sometimes people just wild out on you. Sometimes people hurt you and you didn't deserve it. One of the things that we got to get away as Christians is, saying, is telling God, God, I didn't do nothing. Sometimes God said, I know you didn't. They did something to you. Sometimes people do things to you. Now, what you got to be careful of is don't take that hurt and you turn around and go hurt a whole bunch of other people. There's a, there's a saying, <laughs> there's a saying, a woman can hurt a man and that man would turn around and hurt a hundred women. Some of y'all get that when you get home. (laughs) A woman will hurt one man. She was wrong, but she'll just hurt one man. That man, if he doesn't heal properly, will turn around and hurt a hundred women. Don't take your hurt and abuse other people with it. Trust in God that he sees what you're going through. In verse 10, he's looking at the relationship and he doesn't like what he sees. I see how you talk to your children. I see how you treat your mother. I see how uh, you treat your husband or how you treat your wife. I see how you operate in your family. I, the thing that I'm seeing, does it please God? That's the question that you got to ask right now. God, if you're looking at my relationships right now, does this plea? I see the attitude that you have in the hallway. I see the comments that you make privately and publicly when you think nobody's listening. God is aware of all of our interactions and God is aware of all of our relationships and you're either doing two things. Either you're pleasing God by how you're operating uh, in your family and relationships or you're displeasing God. If your children are misbehaving, trust and believe that God going to come in and give them a life lesson uh, that's a five-star life lesson. Anybody ever had a five-star life lesson? 
that your parents didn't teach. God came in and gave a specialized lesson. God, God will see, uh, God will see if your parents are not treating you right or they're not operating the way that God will ask you to. Don't you know God will step in and give them a specialized lesson? But don't you do wrong with them. And here's another thing that we got to get away from. You're not justified in your sin just because they sin against you first. God doesn't care who did it first. You have to have enough discipline that if you do me wrong, I don't turn around and do wrong and then explain that the reason I did wrong is because I was done wrong. Eddie Kane told you two wrongs. <laughs> didn't he tell you? He told you, didn't he? Two wrongs don't what? Two wrongs don't make it right. <laughs> That's what he told you. So just because somebody do you wrong, that does not give you a license in, in the kingdom of God. That does not give you a license in the church for you to go do wrong. And even though your conscience may not be bothering you for the season, trust and believe a day is coming. And you are saying, well, well, God, why is this happening to me? Because if this person would have never done this to me, if this person would have never, I would have never done these things. No, 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 no. What that person did is what that person did, and that person has to own it. What you did after that is your decision. And guess what? You have to pay. And here's what's very scary. Somebody can do you wrong and then repent to God, and God will turn around and forgive them. And that hot girl summer you had all, all summer long because of what that person did, now God is punishing you and will turn around and bless them because they may have sinned and repented, but you went on, you went on a, a, a spree. <laughs> you went on a spree because you took your pain as a license. What I'm trying to say is cut that license. It's not a real license. It's the devil speaking in your ear saying you're now justified when you're not. It's the conversation in the Garden of Eden. That serpent is talking to Eve, but what he's telling her is a lie. It's really not true. And now she's looking at that forbidden tree, and she's looking at that forbidden fruit saying, I can touch it now, when really you can't. And it's about to change your whole life. It's about to change your whole life because you have not healed from your pain. You're damaged. And guess what? After, you've been, after you have all the fun that you want to have, after you have all the fun that you want to have, guess what? You're still damaged. And sometimes the people who haven't fun with you, sometimes God will speak through them and be like, uh, you know you're broken, right? I mean, we can keep having fun, but you know you like, you need to get some, you need to get some help. And you'll start bleeding over everyone in your environment. So even though I hate what Tamar is going through, I do commend her. And, and, and I commend her at this point because she's struggling in her marriage and she didn't retaliate against him. She didn't try to dog him. She allowed God to come in and fight her battles. And some battles don't belong to you. This battle is the Lord's. Somebody says, well, I need to do something. Sometimes you just need to be still and say, I'm going to let God. When you, hey, I'm going to say this. When you know there's sin and, and somebody's doing you dirty, sometimes the main thing to do is make sure your hands are clean and you get out of the way. The Lord coming and you need to get out of the way. You need to make sure that your hands are not as dirty as them. Because when the Lord comes, he's getting everyone whose hand is on it. And sometimes you being quiet and you being still allows God to focus on them. And stop putting the clock on God. Let God do <laughs> what God is going to do. The Bible says here uh, in the text, uh, it displeased the Lord and uh, and uh, therefore he slew him, we in verse 11. And the Bible says, then said Judah to Tamar, 
his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at thy father's house till Shalab my son be grown. For he said, lest preadventure he die also as his brothers did. And Tamar went and dwelt in, in her father's house. And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, uh, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to the sheep shearers to Timnath. And he and his friend Harad the Dolomite. Uh, and it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law goes up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put uh, her widow's garments off from her and covered her, uh, covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and set in an open place, which is by the way of Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. So as we covered on last time, Judah had told Tamar, he said, hey, listen, I know you've lost two husbands. That, that has to be damaged. That has to do something to you mentally. But he gives her a promise and said, hey, listen, I want you to hold off. I have another son. I want you to go stay at your father's house. And he says, I want you to remain a widow. To remain a widow means that you keep the garments of a widow on, right? So every morning that she gets up to get dressed, she's putting on widow's garments which means she's letting every available man in the city know, I was married and I've lost, but here's, here's the next step, and I'm mourning. It's a way to stay away, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are some garments a sister can put on, which means leave me alone. <laughs> I'm not in the mood and, and leave me alone. There are, there are other garments that a sister can put on and say, hello. <laughs> right? Anybody got any hello boots? <laughs> you got any hello boots? <laughs> right? You got some hello garments. And so uh, what she's deciding to do, she says, I don't like his pattern. She's talking about a father-in-law. I don't like his patterns. I don't like the way he's moving. He made me a promise and he's not fulfilling his promise. I don't like, and, and so imagine this, I've already lost two husbands and the reason I lost them because they weren't even good men. And then on top of that, I got a father-in-law who made me a promise, but I'm starting to see his pattern and I'm starting to look at the men in this family and oh Lord, I made a bad decision. Have you ever gone through a season in your life, you start looking around and you, you got angry with yourself because how did I get myself in this family? Before you go any further, I need to explain to you that this family is the tribe Jesus comes out of. So before you curse the tribe of Judah <laughs> and the men of Judah, just know the son of God comes out of this tribe and she's in this and she says I'm now going to take things into my own hands you become a different version when you don't trust you don't you're, you're not you when you go through damage like I said, if you realize that you damaged, your goal is not to accept that state. It's the devil's lie that tells you it's always going to be like this. I'm always going to be treated like this. I'm never going to experience this. I'm never going to smile. I'm not going to break through. Some of you, you experience the same emotions every day. And the reason why you experience the same emotions every day, because somewhere through the damage, you stop believing that a better day was coming. And so, you, the feelings that you have today, you had them yesterday. And you had them on Friday, and you really had them on Thursday, and you had them also on, on Tuesday, and you walk around, and there is this sadness, there is this, uh, this weight that never leaves you 
because it's connected to a thought and the thought is telling you this is it. You are past your prime. You've been damaged so much. You can't be repaired. So now you're trying to now you're trying to convince people to love your cracks and to love your brokenness. Don't love my brokenness. I don't want anybody to love my cracks and love my brokenness. What I need to do, and if, if I realize that I'm cracked and broken, what I really need to do is take that season and that time and give my cracks and my brokenness to Jesus, who is a healer. If you don't believe that Jesus is a healer, then you will settle with your cracks and brokenness. God, didn't cre God did not create you to stay broken. God did, not, God did not create you and bless you and wake you up in the morning and give you a brand new day so that you can limp around. And limp around because of something that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. If you believe that Jesus is a healer, what I'm trying to say is you can not only, not only go back to how you used to be, you can be better than what you've ever been if you fully commit yourself to healing uh, and being restored by God. But at this particular point, don't do what Tamar did. The Bible says, verse 14, she put off her widow's garments from off her and covered her with a veil and she wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way of Timnath, for she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him the wife. When Judah saw her, don't, don't miss verse 15. When Judah saw her, the Bible says he thought she was a prostitute. They hadn't talked because maybe if he'd have asked and asked her some questions, he would have recognized the voice. The Bible says he walking up to Tim, Timnath, and now he's taking these trips. And the Bible says he looked, and the Bible says she sat in an open place. I don't know where she found her chair at, but she had found a little chair, and she had sat in an open place, and she knew his pattern. He been going up here with his friend all this time. I know what he doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to position myself to be one of them. And she get in the open place when he walking by. She don't say nothing. She just in the, she just in the hello attire. <laughs> right? She in the hello attire. And he look. Now, if you a godly man, if you a godly man, you'll be walking by. Sister, you need to cover up. <laughs> right? Amen. Amen. Amen, brothers. Sister, sister, sister. Gather, gather yourself. <laughs> yeah, you're all outside and you're ungathered. You need to gather yourself. <laughs> you're, un you're ungathered. Uh, uh, the, that's what a golly, that's what a golly man uh, would would do. Um, but I got to say this about Judah. He damaged too. You lost two sons. And both your boys are dead. And the reason they dead is they may have been good sons, but they wasn't good husbands. And because they wasn't good husbands, it's a reflection on your fatherhood. Now you got one son left. Are you trying to keep him alive? <laughs> and you delaying the marriage? So now you taking these trips with your friend to Timnath, trying to recover? And now you got two damaged people in Timnath? Hey, be very careful. Because sometimes when you damage, you attract other damaged people. When you broken, your heart broken, and his heart broken, and y'all both find each other in the club. <laughs> and you know what you say? If I was healthy, if I was healthy, if I was healthy, I would have never seen you. If I was whole, I would have never entertained this conversation. 
If I was in my right mind, I'd have never opened the door. Matter of fact, that ain't even, but sometimes when you're damaged and you're broken, you entertain and you seek things and you find yourself in rooms you ain't got no business being in because you're damaged. He ain't got no business on this road to Timnath and because she hurt, she over there looking open, <laughs> amen, uh, uh, and, and, and getting attention. And the Bible says they see each other. That's his daughter-in-law. She wants a child so bad that now she's willing to step outside of the will of God to get it. Because at this point, I am do something. Sometimes you can go through so, so many things, you can go through so many things in your life that you start to say, I deserve some happiness. Can I tell you something? You don't deserve happiness. Because Jesus died on the cross, you don't deserve anything. Because if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, you wouldn't even have life. So for you to say, I'm going to leave Jesus Christ and I'm going to deserve to do me in this seat. No, no, no. You were bought with a price. Your whole life. May your whole life. Your whole life belongs to God. So you taking a break, you, you're not qualified to take a break when somebody has died on the cross for you. You don't get a break. Because your, your whole life belongs to the Lord. So here they are, and they meet each other. And the Bible says in verse 16, you know, I wish he, I wish he didn't do it. He saw her. She wasn't on the road. She was just in vision. She was in view. He saw a harlot. And normally, like I said, if you're a godly man and if you see a prostitute, you hit the gas a little bit harder. You go. That's not something that you entertain. The Bible says he saw her in verse 16. Oh, verse, uh, uh, in verse 16. He saw, he turned in, um, by the way, and he said, uh, go to, I pray thee, let me. You shouldn't pray about this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he, he's spiritually not where he need to be. You don't pray about this. <laughs> You know, you know, he said, um, he said uh, go to, I pray thee, um, let, let me come to thee. <laughs> he said, let me, let me come to thee, uh, for he knew not that she was his. Now, they're not related. They only re related by marriage. So in her mind, she didn't fix it. She, she didn't fix it. I'm going to be taken care of. I'm going to have a child, and if I can't, I tried to do it the right way, but it ain't working, so let me, let me get on here and find my, my way. And she said, uh, he comes to her, he says, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how you, how you approach. He said, hey, he said, uh, he said, <laughs> He said, hey, how you, he said, hey, how you doing? What's, you know, what's going on? How you, you doing okay? Uh, you look cold and everything, so. And she says, uh, he says, uh, would, you, would, you, would you like some company? She's a businesswoman at this particular point. Because <laughs> you got to set your price. You got to set your price. She says, okay, uh, well, I'm not free. I'm not, I'm not free. She says, what will you give me? that you may uh, come, <laughs> this King James Version, <laughs> that you may come in un, <laughs> unto me. <laughs> what is, she said, what's the, <laughs> what you got to give? We're in verse 17. Uh, and he said, well, uh, let me see. Uh, let me see what I got. <laughs> uh, he said, um, I got this little goat. <laughs> Is that, is, that, is that good? I got a little kid. <laughs> and she said, uh, no, I need, I need a little bit more than that. This is the negotiation part. She said, I need a, I need a little bit more than that. Uh, he's, so, he's so driven by lust, he doesn't recognize her voice. He's so driven by lust. Be careful what you lust after. Sometimes the thing that you lust after can damage you. 
Some of us have been hurt, not because other people hurt us. Some of us have been damaged because of the things you wanted so badly that in your pursuit to get it, you got cut. And so now you're bleeding because you wanted something. And she says, uh, will you give me a pledge till you send it? Verse 18. And he said, uh, what pledge? Or oh, I mean, well, I mean, what you want? <laughs> what you want? What, what kind of pledge you want? And she said, um, she said, give me, give me your ring. Take your, take your bracelet off. I see you with your, I mean, Judah, Judah was rolling through. He was rolling through. He had a little jewelry on. <laughs> she said, uh, take all that off. Give me, give me your ring. Give me, give me your bracelet. Uh, I like your little stick in your hand that you was walking with. <laughs> you know, he was walking with his—he was walking with his stick, with his bracelets and the signet on. She said, "I like your little staff." She said, "Give me that little staff too, uh, that's in your hand." She just—I mean, she had to look him up and down, right? She had to look him up and down. Uh, give me that ring. Uh, give me them bracelets, and give me—be very careful. You'll lose all your stuff. Trying to heal your own heart. Without any negotiation, he over there. Yeah, what you, what you want? What you, you want this stick? You want this stick? <laughs> right? He giving up all his stuff. <laughs> and the reason she did it, and, and the reason she did it, is because she has trust issues. She has trust issues. She doesn't trust. So there's a difference that I want to explain real quick and then we'll close. Trust issues is when a person has trouble trusting others due to betrayal. When somebody says you got trust issues, sometimes it's hard to trust again because you haven't healed from your betrayal. In order for you to be in any healthy relationship with your children, coworkers, family, friends, romantic, whatever the case may be, you have to be able to trust. And some of us have not learned to trust again after betrayal, because it's hard. So then you go into the next relationship, or you interact with family, and your movements are only to protect yourself. The way that she's operating, she's only trying to protect herself. But now she's starting to hurt herself because she used her body that God gave her and now she's using it as currency to try to get what she wants. She's not only devalued herself, but she has now brought her father-in-law deeper into sin all because they're damaged. She couldn't trust her first husband. She couldn't trust her second husband. And now all of the men in her life, now she's starting to see a pattern. There are some women who believe deep down in their heart, you can't trust any man. And that's not God. That's, those are just the experiences that you have. All you need is about two or three experiences and you didn't curse the rest of the whole gender. Women are evil. They're evil. And you can, and you can give your evidence to see in this, <laughs> see this one did this one to me and this one did this one. And, then, and after about two or three cases, you'll curse the whole gender. And if you curse on the whole de gender, that just means you're damaged. God doesn't create damaged people. It is Satan that attacks us. If you don't know how to forgive and recover, you will stay broken. And then you'll, and then you'll walk around with broken eyes. You'll, broke, you'll walk around with a, a broken spirit. And so a pattern is different. A pattern is a repeated design. We recognize each other because we recognize patterns. I know it's you because you talk a certain type of way, you walk a certain type of way, you eat certain food. Every one of you, you have patterns, which, all, which lets all of us know it's you. 
all right? Uh, when somebody says, uh, do, you, do, you know, do you know Jimmy did this? They say, no, 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 Jimmy wouldn't do that. And the reason why you defend Jimmy, you know why? It's because you studied their, their pattern. That's how I know it's you, and that's how, I, and that's how you know it's me, because we have, a, we have a pattern, you know? And so you could tell, uh, but every now and then, if you get damaged, your pattern changes. Sometimes you don't have trust issues. Sometimes you just recognize patterns, right? Can you, can you tell when somebody's lying? Can, we, can you tell when somebody's being deceitful? Can you, can you tell when somebody is, is being sneaky? And have you ever been betrayed before? And you ever been hurt before? Because I, I need you to understand, there's a difference between having trust issues and recognizing patterns. And when somebody starts talking to you a certain type of way, you're like, uh-uh, I know that combination. 4431, 4431, uh-uh, I know that, I know that pattern. 4431, get away from me. All right? When somebody starts asking, uh, you know, hey, I know, I know, uh, you know, we just met and everything. I know, you know, but I just wanted to, I got a little situation. I wanted to know if you could be able to kind of, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know. You say, hey, I think you, I think you hustling me. Have anybody ever been swindled out, out some money and, and you've been lied to? 4431. And you see a pattern, 4431. And you gotta be careful because sometimes the devil will come and make you feel guilty and say, well, why you don't trust me? I don't know you. I don't know you, but the pattern that you're showing, 4431, that, that pattern that you're showing me lets me know that I need to back away from you. That's called wisdom. That, that's called wisdom. Trust issue, you have trust issues when somebody didn't even do anything and you're making them jump through all of these different hurdles and they're looking at you like, I don't know why, why am I doing that? They haven't shown a pattern of unfaithfulness. They have not shown a, a pattern of lying. They have not shown any path. They haven't shown you anything. You're struggling because you just have trust issues. So you putting everybody else through this rigorous test because you have trust issues. That's a difference between having trust issues and you being wise saying, Mm -mm, I, see, mm -mm, I see it all. I've, you sound like, okay, you said the same thing. You're moving in this. and No, no, we're not doing that. Hey, can I come in for some, some coffee? I don't even drink coffee. We don't even, I see what you're doing. It's late. <laughs> no, -uh. I see what you're doing. I don't even drink coffee like that. There's some juice at 7-Eleven. Let's go to this. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go to 7-Eleven, <laughs> let's go to 7-Eleven and talk. I don't even carry coffee in there because I understand how by the way that you're moving. So one of the things that we have to learn, we have to learn how to see patterns and then heal from our trust issues so that we don't go back to the same scene again and get damaged. I'm gonna show you just one scripture, how God did it, and the lesson be yours very quickly. I need you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 56. And the Bible says, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then have this man all these things? Y'all see in verse 6, 56, they start asking questions. And because of the way that they were talking, Jesus is observing their pattern of talking. Right? Jesus, Jesus is seeing how they're moving with him. And the Bible says in verse 57, and they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his, his own house. And notice what he did in verse 58. And he did not many mighty works there because of their what? Jesus says, I'm going to keep to myself. 
Y'all remember the stories of Jesus walking on water, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind. Uh, he, he was going in and, and raising children and, and, and removing demons, and he was blessing, and people were coming all out in the street saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus, you're the greatest. You are the Son of God, uh, 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 Peter later explained. But when Jesus comes to these people and he sees the way that they're talking, he sees a pattern. The Bible says, he says, uh-uh, I'm not doing any miracles here. I'm not going to open up my heart here because I'm around people who have shown me a pattern that they don't believe. So what Jesus, this is a waste of, this is a waste of time. And the only thing that's going to happen if I, if I stay here is I'm going to frustrate myself and I'm going to frustrate you because you don't believe and you really don't want to receive what I have. And then I'm going to get frustrated because you're not receiving what I believe will be beneficial to you. And so because I see this pattern, Jesus doesn't have trust issues. He has wisdom because he's able to see the pattern. On this morning, when people look at you, what pattern do you show? How do you operate? Can people trust you? I know you, I know you got a long list of, of people you don't trust. I get it. We got you, you got your list. You got long people that ain't trustworthy. Here's the question though. When people look at you, can they trust you? If I, if I see your pattern, do we go to you for prayer? Do any of your coworkers ask you to pray for them? because of the way that you talk or how you operate and how you move? Do your children trust you? Does your, does your wife trust you? Does your husband trust you? Is your pattern showing something different than what you're advertising? I'm a, I'm a good man, man, but that 4431 that you're doing over here is contradicting what you saying over here? What is it that when God looks in your home, what does he see? Is there anything that displeases him? Is it the way that you move? Is it the way that you talk? Are you operating from a broken vehicle? If you are this morning, you got to do something different. And you put it on the face like you ain't hurt. And you acting like you're not damaged. And you acting like everything's okay because you make everybody else laugh and nobody can make you laugh. And you make sure everybody else is okay, but you never okay. And you making sure everybody else is tended to when you don't have your needs met. That season got to end. That, that pattern that you're doing where you're calling everybody and then you sitting back and nobody called me and then you, you taking care of everybody and nobody take care of you. Like what I'm saying is you, you have a pattern and that pattern is not healthy for you. It's actually dysfunctional and you got to stop because you're not getting healthy. You're not even the best version of you by you continuing that pattern. Something has to shift so you can start making some steps toward health. And being whole, don't you ever think that God gets any pleasure from you hurting every day? God don't want me crying every day. He loves me. God loves me. God don't want me to be a, a broken a, a, a version of myself. God don't want me operating by 50% for the rest of my life. He loved me. And in the promises that's in his word, he, if he's a healer, then it's okay if I'm hurt, but I shouldn't be hurt for the rest of my life. I shouldn't be broken for the rest of my life. I shouldn't be damaged for the rest of my life. The Lord is praying for his church that we might all Say the Lord, the Lord is praying for he.